most of the elements that are described in this report of what a new system might look like, the system we're trying to imagine, already exist. They just don't exist in any one place in a whole. So there are three things I just want to sort of say a little bit about, which I think help us to, to move towards a whole system of the sort that's described in this report and which uh, I think is described in the white paper as well. And the first is about the narrative, if you like, the, the story we need to tell that is itself, I hope, transformational. And that's a story about saying we need to reject models that historically have been focused on the deficits that exist in people uh, and uh, deficit models uh, and approaches to ones that are focused on looking at the assets of people, of communities, and therefore are focused on ideas of building resilience, of reciprocity, of responsibility. And in that sense, we have to challenge some of the misconceptions, if you like, the notions, the labels, the stigma almost that it gets attached to debates about our health and care system. Not least the painting of older people and disabled people as burdens, as costs, as problems uh, that we have somehow to deal with as a society. And we have to sp spread and popularise these ideas of how we tap into the hidden wealth in our communities. Uh, those networks of relationships uh, that are an essential part of what define us as people, but also what define health, well-being, wellness. And in that sense, I think one of the key goals of the system, which is alluded to in this report, is absolutely something that needs to be explicit for Public Health England, for the Department of Health and for others in the system, is the goal of preventing, postponing uh, the onset of morbidity, both physical and mental, uh, in our society. And I think that requires, fundamentally, a new front end to the system. It requires one that's based on well-being, one that's based on wellness. We can't have a conversation about system change without talking about demand, and that's why preventing, postponing and managing morbidity well are absolutely key. And that, I think, when it comes to this debate about health and care, requires us to think beyond a mere safety net when it comes to care. Because crisis action is wasteful, and well-being and wellness, I think, have to be absolutely central to a successful strategy for bending the demand curve, for managing the pressure on the more formal parts of our care system, not least the NHS. And when it comes to resources, the Comprehensive Spending Review of 2010 was all about, from my point of view in social care, building a bridge, a bridge from the current system to a reform system. And that's what the draft bill and the white paper are all about, moving to a more universal offer in care and support of information and advice of that asset-based preventative approach of making sure that the market responds in a way and that there is a sufficiency of supply. The Select Committee, right since David Hinchcliffe's uh, leadership of it, have written reports about the need for integration of health and social care, but we still don't have that uh, uh, idea in practice. So we need to have leadership that changes, that is about collaboration and is about crossing barriers and boundaries between organisations. And we need a spending review in the next parliament that actually ensures we're investing in those things correctly. We have to tackle the lottery, the lottery of care fees. Uh, and long-term care uh, is a failed market. There is no way in which you can successfully insure yourself against the risks of needing to pay for care later in your lives. And I think Do Not does offer a rational response to the future. And it does, by pooling those tail end risks, allow us to make progress. But there is, you know, an institutional obstacle to success in this area. It's called Her Majesty's Treasury. It's called the Treasury's inability, I think, to grapple with multi-spending period decisions. Local government has been remarkably successful at reconfiguring services over the last 20 years. It's reconfigured services far more frequently than the NHS has done over that period. I think there are lessons to be drawn from democratic institutions at a local level that actually are able to broker the necessary consensus and in some cases break the consensus to make change happen on the ground. And I think at a national level, the NHS Commissioning Board, with its role of commissioning primary care, has a huge opportunity to reshape the landscape. To draw all this together, I think there's a convergence taking place between public health, social work and social care, and health. And I think that's really exciting. 
Because I think investment upstream, building uh, a new front end to the system and shifting that center of gravity from transactional to relationship-based care really is the key to a sustainable system. And I look forward to the discussion and the debate that the King's Fund is going to foster. Thank you very much.